I'm back again today with Glenn. Um, we're going to follow up on this Stephen Wolfram theory of everything, this idea of computation. And uh, I'm really excited about this because I put out my two little solo videos trying to walk my way through Stephen Wolfram, but it will really help to have the mind of a physicist and mathematician like yourself, Glenn. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> to think these things through. So um, I'm going to share a screen to start with and play a little clip from Stephen Wolfram's update on the Wolfram Physics Project that he did in October. And, um, and I, I just going to play a few minutes of this and every, hopefully everybody can listen patiently for three or four minutes and then you'll kind of see where we're headed with this. Because in, in many ways, our models provide a machine code that is sort of underneath the kinds of things that have been studied in mathematical physics. And the things that have been studied in mathematical physics kind of show us different directions and extensions that can be uh, possible on the basis of our kinds of models. So, you know, maybe I should just say a little bit about, uh, uh, okay, in terms, of, in terms of my sort of conceptual development from the things that we've been doing, I would say two big things have happened. One, I understand more and more about kind of uh, how to really think about these models that we have and how to really think about their relationship to physics. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I've realized that sort of inside these models is a meta idea that is more general than physics and can be applied to many other fields. And one of the things for me that I've been excited about is what I'm calling the multi-computational paradigm um, this kind of thing that's that I'll talk about a little bit more here in a moment. Um, that is kind of is is the meta model underneath these models of physics that we have, and that meta model can now be applied. It seems to a whole variety of other areas. And okay, so just to put a pin in this mm -hmm. this meta model that he's talking about. <clears throat> as he goes on to talk about it, I'd like everybody to kind of keep in mind this picture I've been trying to draw of how the elements and principles of design work out in the way that they, they, they draw connections that have infinite variability, but they're still within the space of, of, the, one, of the one structure. So as he talks about the meta model, try to keep that picture in mind. Really provides sort of a, a new paradigm for thinking about theoretical models in general, and it's applicable to a whole range of different areas. Okay, why is that interesting? Uh, one of the reasons that's particularly interesting is um, that uh, um, the, um, um, uh, the, the, I think we might have a wrong video here. Maybe somebody can fix that. Um, the, uh, um, one of the reasons that's particularly interesting is because physics, has been so successful over the past 100 years. So there's a lot that we know from physics. So if we discover that the same fundamental paradigmatic model works between physics and let's say immunology or economics or linguistics or evolutionary biology, if we know that the same underlying paradigmatic models work in both those cases, then it allows us to take ideas and successes from physics and import them into those other areas and also allows us to take things that are understood in those areas and for which we have intuition in those areas and apply them to physics. And so that the possibility by having the sort of common underlying paradigmatic model, we have this possibility of making that relation. Well, and what he's talking about here is this idea that all truth is truth, wherever it comes from. So if you find something that's true in one arena, it's going to be true in another arena. And so those those models. So, yeah. So let's keep. Maybe I should say a little bit about, a about kind of the way I think about our models of physics um, um, now. Um, the kind of the starting point, in a sense, for our whole way of thinking about physics and the universe and so on is sort of what's the universe made of, and in sort of the traditional view of that has been, well, the first thing we just introduce in things is space. 
and space is just something that is, and we can put things at different positions in space and so on, but there's no question you ask about what space made of. The sort of the starting point for our whole uh, set of models is to think, well, actually, it's made of something. What's it made of? It's made of these discrete elements. These elements have the only thing about them is their identity, that this, this element is distinct from that element. Then there are relations between these elements and the way that we are imagining these relations work, and it turns out to be a very nice, flexible way to do it, it's just there's a relation between elements. There are three elements, they are related. It's element one, element two, element three, they're all related. And there's an order to that relation. Um, it's, you now you can imagine other ways. Now, what else does that sound like? <laughs> anyway, I'll stop here with this one. And I'm going to throw the ball to you, Glenn, and uh, see what you would like to talk about at this point, because I know you have a lot of ideas and and there's a, a well, half I, a dozen I, other videos. I think I have a, a strong sense of what he's talking about, but he, you know, he's an incredibly brilliant man and he's talking like a mathematical physicist. And so I'm, I'm not sure but people quite understand the the fundamental nature of what he's getting to and, and how deep it goes. And so maybe that's what our the talk today and maybe there'll be more. We're gonna try and make what he's trying to say in, intelligent, intelligible to your listeners. So that's our, our, our task, for, I guess, for today. For and I, I would like to make one, just one little caveat on my side. When he says that the universe is computational, um, I can fully believe that, but I'm taking the word computational in a slightly different way than he probably is giving it out. Although over time, as I've watched him work on this project, his own image of what computational is, is changing. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really interesting to watch. But for me, the interesting thing about this computational thing is that it's a picture. It's, it's a picture that allows us to understand something fundamental about the universe but that doesn't mean that we're some kind of a computer simulation. Correct. Right? And, and computation, the way you explained it to me especially, goes so much deeper in terms of what it means at the fundamental level, that computation is these things that fit together and then something happens and comes out of that, right? You could, you could go that way. Well, we could try a, a number of different ways to explain comp computation today. And we'll see which one works for your listeners. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, it, all of this stuff intertwines together, and it, and the more I get into it, the more amazing it, it becomes. And and he's right. What you start out with basic physics, you end up at if you take it far enough, you end up at Jordan Peterson's level. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard a comment once, and I and I I, I find it quite true. Is uh, we're talking about fundamental questions in physics and, and the person answered, you have to remember that if you're going to start answering questions in fundamental physics, you're obligated to take those answers to their complete logical conclusions. You know, if you're, if you're going to theorize and, and, and speculate at that level, then you're sort of morally obligated to go all the way with your, your speculation. And so if you start with this notion of computation as fundamental and you follow it all the way to its logical end, it, it becomes quite amazing. So we can, I think what we'll do is probably hit a lot of different bases today. And we'll, as, as I talk, we'll see how things connect back and forth between the conversations. Um, Sounds good to me. <clears throat> okay. So to, um, to start the, the, the frame of the talk today, I was um, looking at Stephen um, Wolfram's conversation with uh, Greg Chaitin. Mm -hmm. that, um, I found that I've gone through it several times and it's fascinating. He's kind of a funny speaker to listen to, but if you're patient, he just had, there's some just amazing gems that, that come out. And I included in, in our links a couple of other uh, Greg Chaitin uh, interviews on Closer to Truth with uh, mm -hmm. Robert Kuhn. 
And where he's talking about is mass discovered or invented. And then uh, he also does a segment on uh, does God exist or what's the nature of God? And I want to get back to these because those are, if you listen to Greg talk, those are the same question. Mm -hmm. So let's you know, step forward to uh, the, the, the first conversation about the 58 or 9 minute mark, if you remember right, he takes a break and he puts his wife on, Virginia. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and that was kind of sweet being an old married guy like myself. But <laughs> I was surprised she said some really incredible things. And that's where I want to start. Oh, with, think, Virginia's, um, with Virginia's part? Um, yes. If, if we could, I'd like, I might want to just back up a couple of minutes because um, just a couple of minutes before yeah, she comes on, there's a lot of good stuff about what is the world built out of. Um, well, I'd like to start with her before we tackle that question. Okay, so we can start there and then back up. Yeah, because okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I don't think people think about too much. Okay, and, so um, let me see. That's the conversation between, and then she shows up. You said about 58? Uh, let me run through my... Here, I got it. I got it. Yeah, Please. we've been sitting here. Say hi to Stephen Virginia. <laughs> hi, Stephen. 5850. <laughs> Hey, so what are you, are you still working on philosophy and things? Um, yes, yes. In the, in, when I have a break with, uh, with the children, yes. Right now, now I'm involved in uh, organizing a centenary for Paul Feyerabend. It, uh, I uh, call Carl Feyerabend. And so um, his widow, um, Grazia Borini Feyerabend, she, um, she organized a foundation in, in Zurich where they lived. And, um, and so they're organizing a centenary all around the world. And I'm in the work group for um, Latin America. <laughs> so, so he had, he, he was, his primary thing was a philosophy of, of, of science, right? Yes, and, but he was also a physicist. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, he was. What, he what was, kind of physics did he do? I, I am not very familiar with his physics. So Greg what, is more familiar than I am. So you, you could ask him this question, but well, um, I, I am more familiar with his philosophy of science. Yes. What, what was the, what, I'm, I'm just curious. I, since, yes, we're, of course. since we have this break here, uh, yes. so I, I, know, <laughs> I know rather little about that philosophy. What, how, did that, how did that fit into, um, um, how, how did it fit into other things that were going on? Okay, okay. So, um, um, there was this debate if you could um, draw a line between uh, science and other other forms of knowledge. Um, how could you um, state if a certain theory is scientific or not? Um, this was in the 40s, let's say in the 40s, 50s. This was a very strong debate in Europe. And there was this um, um, dialogue between Popper, Kuhn, um, Lakatos and Feyerabend. These four philosophers were trying to answer this question. Uh -huh. And um, Popper and um, uh, Lakatos um, had a rationalistic point of view. They, were, they differed in, in the way they thought things went in separating science from other forms of knowledge, but they still thought that science was a, a let's say, was was built upon a rational uh, construction of knowledge, whereas Kuhn and Feyerabend thought that there were irrational elements in uh, in the coming up with scientific theories, and mm -hmm. not uh, not only coming up with them, but sometimes even accepting a scientific theory involved other other uh, let's say variables, criteria, whatever. For example, That's uh, good. You social can stop and political um, okay. pressures. Let's okay. So, um, so she said that Kuhn, Feyerabend, Lakatos, and Popper were having this debate about um, where mm -hmm. where could you draw the line to decide whether an idea was scientific or not. 
and that Popper and Lakatos felt that science was built upon a rational construction of knowledge. But Kuhn and Feyerabend felt that there, ir there were irrational elements in science. So I like this because it's, it's the, your distinction between the reducible and the irreducible world. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an element in the, in the sciences, physics, the materialist, phys physicalist, that believe in a constructible universe, that everything based on rules and you build up and you discover by inventing. So once the debate, it would say math is invented, physics is invented. Karl Popper and Kuhn, on the other hand, oh, Feyerabend and Kuhn would say, no, physics and math is discovered. And because it's a discovery process, it's now no longer something that you can create an algorithm and rationally can chunk away at it. That if, if physics and math is, becomes the same as art, there's an element of faith, uh, music. Um, and Kuhn, uh, you know, I've read his book a couple of times and he really got flamed for it at the time. And he, he did a couple of apology tours afterwards to, to try and reinstate himself into the good graces because he basically was saying that science proceeds the same as all the other arts that, he, uh, that we do. And that makes sense if you believe that science is a process of discovery. Whereas if you believe science is a process of invention, then you're the other side. You reject the, the notion that, that science involves emotion. So that's where I want to frame it because Greg Chaitin is definitely in the math is discovered category. Mm -hmm. and you understand a lot better what Stephen Wolfram is trying to do. If you, at least I do, if I come at it with the, in, with the, the spirit of discovery rather than invention. Yeah, at um, one point later on in the video, I think it's later in the video, um, Wolfram is trying to clarify with, with Chaitin and Wolfram actually says that he sees physics as being something that is just there and that you need to find the pieces of it in order to begin to understand more about it. And, mm -hmm. and he thought maybe that Chaitin had the idea that math was something different, but Chaitin says, no, no, I'm a Platonist. I believe that math is something that's just there. And, mm -hmm. and, and all we can do is discover pieces of it. Now, I think both of these guys <clears throat> have moved from some other position that they were at earlier and have moved closer to this because when I go back and do some research on Chaitin, some of the earlier things he said, it sounds very much as though he feels like math in some ways is invented. But now he sounds very much like math is discovered. And, uh, and Wolfram even says in the video, in the last two months, I've come to this view. Right. He, he got the aha. <laughs> well, the, one of the, the great Chaitin, uh closer to truth ones I link to is math and mathematics invented or discovered. He talks about his transition. Oh, he does. And, you yeah, know, I don't, really I don't want to, I don't want to put that, I don't want to embed that in this video though, because the closer to truth one is one of those that's monetized. And so it might make this video not viewable because they come after me and they okay. say, yeah. Right. So if you yeah, can just can summarize. It. Well, what he, he starts out thinking that, you know, his younger days that, that math is something you invent, you create. But then his discussions, he actually met, he's talked with Girdle in, in the old days. He's an old timer, he's older mm -hmm. than we are. <laughs> and he was, he talks about Girdle's approach to things. And somewhere in that, over time, Chaitin evolved to thinking that math should be more empirical. You, he, you should do math more like the physicists do. You can see experiment, you know, try things, ex, um, see what works. And I was thinking when he said that, yeah, but that's exactly how the process of discovery goes. If you believe math is invented, you sit in a room and you crank out whatever. If you believe math is discovered, then you have to go out and try things. You explore, you, um, 
this is one of the layers to the girdles um, proof that doesn't get talked about. And I want to include this is that everyone knows about the incompleteness um, theorems that basically says if you have an axiomatic system complex enough to include basic arithmetic, there will be statements that are true but cannot be provable within the axiomatic system that you have. So that's, you know, the irreducible phenomena that, that Stephen Wolfram talks about. That you have a set of rules, a set of axioms and theorems based on those, but there are things up higher you can't get to starting from just the rules you have. Mm -hmm. So what Gödel says, well, you can take something up here that you can't, you know is true, and you can add it now as an axiom and you create a bigger, you know, more expanded uh, axiomatic system now that you've included this true statement that was formerly unprovable. But what Gödel's theorem says is now you play the same game again and there'll be other stuff which is not provable within this framework. And so you build up on this, these layers of complexity, of irreducible complexity, of benches, of steps, and it goes on. It doesn't stop. And that's one of the aspects to Gödel's incompleteness theorems that people don't, isn't discussed and appreciated, is that what he's telling you is that there's layers and there's, it goes on forever. But when you, when, you, when you grab one of these higher things and bring it down and make it axiomatic, that's an act of faith. Yeah. I mean, for example, when, when Einstein came up with, with general relativity, it wasn't provable at the moment, but they brought it down and then they began to act on it and, and, and you know, do experiments and try to find ways of finding out whether it was true. And so, mm -hmm. so all of that, that's an act of faith, right? To some degree, yeah. That's what Thomas Kuhn is trying to point out is that when you make these leaps, there's an act of faith. There's an element of very humanness in them. And the whole idea that science is a rigorous, it's a menu, it's a recipe. You put everything in and you turn the crank and you get results out. Kuhn rejected that. And like I say, he got flack for it. But that's how you have to approach physics or science or math if you believe things are discovered, that they're already out there someplace. Mm -hmm. And so the process of discovery now, you're the pioneer. It's a completely different skill set than if you're just cranking out results. So, and I've tried to, I think we've touched on this before that uh, the term consensus science is, is kind of a pejorative right now, but in a more benign sense, it just means the textbook level of understanding. It's consensus science is what you learn as an undergrad. But if you're going to do foundational research, you have to go beyond the textbooks. You have to go out into a world. You, you cross the Missouri and you're in the frontier now. There's no roadmaps. There's no Michelin, you know, atlas. And so now you have to develop a different skill set of how you think about science and how you approach problem solving, think through things when you don't have textbooks to go from, or if you think the textbooks are wrong, I know that um, uh, popular opinion, uh, we're not supposed to challenge science, but if you're in physics and you can come up with a, uh, some discovery that proved everything we thought was true was wrong, that would be like winning the Powerball lottery for a physicist. To, to actually prove things wrong is what you want to do. It's not, uh, it's not a sin. <laughs> so, well. Well, on a smaller scale, though, that's that's the experience. That's the human experience for every single person, yes. because there are these things that that we can't know, but we have to move forward anyway. And so every move forward that you make is making a choice of of risking courageously, boldly moving out and determining whether something is true or not, which yeah. is part of determining whether or not um, the the thing that you're moving towards is closer to the reality or is it just a flawed map that you're operating in? And so that it's, it's exactly the same process is just expanded on when you get to the level of physics. Well, you use the magic word choice, which is the key to understanding why computation is, is fundamental because I think explain it to, try to explain it once before is 
a computation is just a sequence of choices based on a set of rules. And if you want to get a little more formal, um, uh, a game of checkers is a great example of a computation. You have a starting state, which is you know the pieces on each side. You have a, a domain of cells in this case. You have pieces that you move around. You have a set of rules by which the pieces are moved, and you have an ending state when you know one player has all the pieces and the other player doesn't. So that's mathematically that's probably as good as I can get explaining what computation is at at, at the textbook you know intro abstract level. So a uh, lot but of the things, thing that makes what Wolfram is talking about so much kind of more interesting than a chessboard is that he's talking about the set of all possible rules. Right. Right. And that so, this computation is running all possible rules. Okay, but don't get ahead. We'll come back to this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting a teaser out there so people stick with us. <laughs> so anytime you have a set, you're making a sequence of choices over time by a set of rules, you're doing a computation. Um, Caesar Hidalgo, I think I connected, I left that like, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I'm a fan of his. He's an MIT economist and he's talking about collective intelligence, you know, uh, in terms of economies. But he talks about how a plant is an intelligent agent. It is for doing computation. It's, bringing, it's measuring inputs, sunlight, water. It's making decisions, it's reacting to its environment and it changes and grows. So at, a, at the abstract fundamental level, a plant is a performing computation. And I think a lot of, like you say, people think when you say computation, they mean PCs and, and smartphones, but um, there's another link, uh, another level of computation is the vending machine. It's a computer without memory. I mean, we, I think we talked about that. They're otherwise known as finite state uh, automata. So, one of the things I'm getting to in robotics is language, you know, language and learning. How do you talk to a robot, basically? And you're looking at the structures of language. And I'm looking at natural language is actually more like a symphony. And if you listen to a symphony, you can pick out different instruments. You can find a flute, you can find a drum, you can find the horns. And then if you think about it, a symphony, if that one player, there'll be sheet music, an orchestration that says what that player is supposed to play, what notes and what sequence. So you can break down a symphony into a whole bunch of what you could call formal languages. That's the player sitting there in front, reading the, the lines of music making the instrument, make the sounds, the bar, you know, the rules. So out of each one of those can be considered a formal language and each player playing their instrument can be considered a computational process. Each one is formal, each one is, but you add them all up together, you get something which is not formal. So um, if you look at how we talk using natural language, there's different threads in it. And that's what I'm exploring, you know, programming hardware wise. Can you pick out different threads in how we talk to each other? That if I pull out certain words, can I use those to talk to a robot? But we can come back to that another day. But that's again, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is uh, the instrument playing in a symphony is a form of computation. You can look at it that way. But one of the things that Stephen Wolfram keeps coming back to is that complicated things don't have to come from complicated things. Very simple things can give rise to infinite complexity. And I think one of the, our problems, a lot of an understanding of science and the world philosophy is that we keep thinking life and consciousness and all this is complicated. So it must be coming out of something complicated. But Stevens Wolfram is saying, no, simple rule sets, you know, he talks about rule 30, 
the by you know it's an eight rule single one dimensional automaton and that gives you a completely random output so you have eight rules completely deterministic and you get an output which is random by any measure that we can come up with the other fascinating one is rule 110 and it's the one i'm i like to focus on it's one day imagine a checkerboard which is just one square wide but goes on forever in each direction and then you have pieces that you play on this one dimensional checkerboard of jumping and, and there's rules. And so the cells are either have checkers on them or not. Rule 110, eight rules, it tells you that is turns out to be Turing complete. Well, I was gonna say, it sounds exactly like a Turing machine when you were describing it. Is. It, is. It, okay. it works out to be this one dimensional checker game with eight rules for how to move pieces turns out to be capable of doing any computation that any electronic digital computer that's ever been or ever could be made can do. So that's where Stephen and Wolfram is coming from, is that realization that you can start out with something so basic and get infinite complexity out of that. So you don't need a lot of very complex explanations for life. Well, so, so maybe a little bit later on, I'll share my one. I've been playing around with an idea of one simple rule. And uh, maybe I'll share that a little bit later because I, I mean, there's all these overlaps, you know, truth is truth. Uh -huh. <laughs> so starting with the, this idea that, that physics and math is a discovery process, just like it's a creative process. Let's put it that way. One of the things that Thomas Kuhn did is he was he was a working physicist but he got into the the history of physics and how it's actually been done over the centuries going back to plato and in this regard i just want to put a plug in if you have any, any listeners who is a young person who wants to go on a major in physics the book you have to read is pierre duhaime's to save the phenomena and I have a list of the five most influential books from in me in my life. And that's on that list. And it's essentially, it's an academic, it's a history of physical theory from Plato to Galileo. And it's all the stuff that you don't learn in school. And that was Thomas Kuhn's complaint is that when we learn physics, we, we, we learn physics, it basically starts with Galileo. And we, but he said, if you take an art class, or you take a music class, you learn the history of music, of instruments across cultures, across time. And you learn music theory, theory different episodes. But he said, in, in science, we don't do that. So it's, it's sterile. And um, another way to look at it is, is you look at some of the cathedrals and we say they're elegant, they're beautiful. But we're looking at the cathedral after that was finished, after the scaffolding was taken away. We don't see all of the, the fits and starts, the, the two or three times that the building collapsed while they were trying to build it. And they had to change the design. And we, so when we learn the math and physics, we're learning the distilled, cleaned up, polished version of stuff. And so as science majors often get the idea that science is somehow this perfect thing that it was just born that way, where in fact, like Thomas Kuhn would point out, and Pierre Duhaim would definitely show you, is that science is messy. It's the proverbial going into the kitchen and seeing the sausage being made. And it's very, very much a human activity. And if you look at it that way, then there's leaps of faith. There's craziness. People try stuff, it fails. Um, so that's, um, that's how I approach physics. That's how I think George or Greg Chayton approaches it. It's a process of discovery. You're a pioneer, you're an explorer, you're, you're going into the jungle or you're going into the Rocky Mountains. You don't know what's there. Your intuition, your guesswork, your experience, you, you, you take chances. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. So. You always have to look at physics and math 
as a process of discovery and what kind of vistas open up. So, oh, <laughs> my brain just ran out. That's okay. Well, so um, you said you had been listening to a lot of this lately. Um, maybe I could catch our viewers up a little bit uh, by going back to um, a little piece of their con of the conversation between Gregory Chaitin and Stephen Wolfram. Um, maybe I'll and that way it'll give you some more ammunition to work on. Okay. So we'll take it back here to uh, maybe people will give us a little grace. We'll we'll play just a few minutes of this. Okay. Anyway, the universe has to be built out of something. And right. research it's, it's, and been, physics. it's been fun, but but so after I'm a long technology detour, right? But well, an unnecessary technology detour. Yes, this, this you needed that tool. You needed right. the but, Okay, but 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 philosophically speaking, the universe has to be built out of something. You know, ontology is necessary, even though it's not popular. You know, this pre-Socratic philosophy, what is the universe built out of? Is it built out of number? Is it built out of water? Is it built out of fire? Is it uh, static or is it constantly changing? So anyway, the universe has to be built out of something. And um, marsh, you know, you don't want to build the universe out of marshmallow. It ought to be something pretty sharp and clear. And number is pretty sharp and clear. Pure mathematics is the sharpest, clearest thing we have. So. Uh, you know, if you want to speak theologically, you know, if if God is going to create the universe, um, one possibility is God is a pure mathematician. That used to be a popular view, right? Um, that's the traditional Pythagorean view in more modern language is uh, all is number. Uh, God is a mathematician. And a new, a new version, which I think you and I sort of subscribe to under different versions, is um, all is algorithm. God is a programmer. Except that I don't think that's right, Greg. I don't think God is a programmer. I think that the universe is all possible programs. In other well, words, there is no program. I, li I like I like that, you know, because now I had to listen to this three times until it finally popped into my head what he's saying there, because it sounds like they're agreeing with each other. Chayton is saying all is algorithm. God is a programmer, <laughs> and Wolfram is saying the universe is all possible programs. So why would why did Wolfram say no that's not right Greg because if the universe is all possible programs there has to be someone outside of that who knows all the programs so it's different than just saying all is algorithm god is a programmer it's saying the universe is composed of all possible programs which means there has to be another level up am i right Yes. <laughs> I was hesitant. <laughs> well, maybe we should continue. What, they, what, they've just dis what they've just discussed, we could probably spend a whole hour going over what was just said. Um, there's a, I always had this, this notion of the platonic world, you know, of the Plato's realm of the forms. And you might get the feeling that that's what they're talking about here, but it's not. The Plato's realm of the forms has anything that you could imagine, you know, pink flying Dumbo elephants. You can say it, you can speak it, but in the realm that Stephen is talking about, only that which is physically possible exists. The, the, the program, the script to create an elephant already exists in the universe. The elephant is just a physical instantiation of that information coding, the DNA. This, this gets you into Dawkins, the selfish gene, which when I read it back in the 70s, I thought was a very spiritual statement. I don't know what happened to Richard Dawkins, the, the clown of a, a man you see today, I don't see how 
was the person who wrote that, because what he, he said was that information is more important than the physical instantiation, which means, but it, where does information live? What he's, he's almost making a spiritual statement by that. And you get into uh, Greg Vinter, the, the DNA guy. He wrote mm -hmm. a book called Life at the Speed of Light. And this is a good thought experiment. You could, people could think about it to help form their, their opinions a little deeper. You know, eventually we'll get to Mars and we might discover life, but are we going to collect the samples there and send them back to earth for study? Or can we do a, like a DNA sequence on Mars, basically email the file down to earth, recreate the, create, the life form here on earth and study it here? And Greg Venter's answer is yes. And in fact, they are doing it already. And I'm sure people would actually know, you're, we're essentially capable of 3D printing life forms now from source code. Um, it's all experimental, but it's actually happening in the lab. Something people should maybe worry about. I don't know. So yeah, yeah. Think about especially, it. Especially, especially when you sequence. you see pictures of some of this stuff. Like they, I just saw one the other day that they've come up with some new robot that's created out of frog cells, but it's a living thing. But but what, oh, yeah. once once you've done that, now all kinds of things become possible that maybe we don't want walking around. You know? Well, a number of years ago, uh, a group of researchers uh, cloned a uh, culture of, of rat brain cells and were able to actually keep it alive in a, in a, and hook wires to it. And they put it on a little robot and they trained the robot to go through a maze. Uh, I think, they, um, I can't remember, I think they were able to keep the rat brain cells alive for several weeks at a time. So yeah, it's, they're already using biological. And there's a whole field of research in prosthetics, integrating electronics into your nerves. So we already have cochlear implants. They're uh, working on equivalent for eyes. So we can replace the eye retina with, um, I mean, that's all out there and it's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, this Michael Levin is one of those guys because he's the one that's working on the electrical circuits inside the cells that allows them to communicate yeah. with each other no matter where they are. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. But I want to get back to the question of if okay. you can send life to Earth from Mars, mm -hmm. where is it then? When you talk about what is life, is it is it the hard drive? Is it the electrical signals? Is it the DNA coding? You have to really wrestle with it. Or is it the physical animal itself? Um, so is life coding or is life a physical thing? Or is it both? Um, does the life form exist as a program? But then yeah, um, I don't know, you can spend a lot of time thinking about this. But a lot well, of people- Well, if we're, if we're, one of the things that you started with is the idea that it was information. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I wanted to ask a clarifying question about that because I got to thinking about the the uh, information paradox of, of the information that lives on the event horizon of a black hole. <clears throat> Some of what I've read said that that information, although it's all there, it's all jumbled up and it's not recoverable. Is that correct? You know, I try to make sense out of it. It's okay. Well, that's not like my, my, real, my real question. My underlying question is, is there, a, and this is a stupid question, I know, is there a difference between information and data? Huh. I'm, I'm not sure I, I could answer that one uh, because the way physicists use information, it's doesn't really they don't use it in the same way we would use it. So the physicists in that area of research, which a lot of people question, uh, if Stephen Wolfram's work plays out, then all of that is gone. Sure, because so he I'm sees really he sees a black hole as the place where time ends, not as a place that 
swallow stuff up. <laughs> well, the different picture. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that one, but yeah. Um, to that, to a certain, there's a, a physicists who are materialists, and there are physicists like myself who accept strong emergence. We believe that algorithms actually have an existence separate that that information or or does have a physical um, basis that's landauer's principle if people want to dive into it that that information is physical because it obeys the laws of physics so we often think physical means it has mass you can feel it you can punch it but the general statement is something is physical if the laws of physics apply to it and it turns out information, in certain sense, the laws of physics apply to it because entropy comes in and energy and stuff. But the physicists who are doing cosmology and that level are not using it in the sense that Landauer talks about it or how we use it. They're counting states, they're, they're using it like stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can't explain it, it doesn't make sense to me. The math works, and so you publish papers. Um, uh, the physicist Sabina Hassenfelder, um, I think you follow her. She's a yeah. good person. She's She's been on a campaign for quite a few years now of, of how physics has gone way off the deep end and it's no longer being productive. A lot of people are sensing that. Um, the, this last year, the, the Nobel P, uh, Prize in Physics was split between a group that did computer modeling for global warming and another guy who did research in spin glasses. Um, my thesis touched on spin glasses, so I think I can speak with a little authority on this, but it doesn't deserve uh, a Nobel Prize. It's, it's a niche area in uh, condensed matter. It's, it's theoretically possible, so people explore it experimentally, but there's no foundational work there. So this last year, the physics Nobel Prize was, was pretty empty. And I think that's a, a telling statement how uh, stuck the field of physics is. But so I can segue back to, <laughs> to Chaitan and um, Stephen Wolfram, because if you're an explorer, you want ideas that help you. And I think Chaitan in his conversation, he uses the word fertile, that ideas should be fertile, that they should, if you come up with a new idea, it should open doors, it should give you, uh, Feynman talks about a, a good idea being a tool, it becomes uh, a, a new development, it becomes a tool that you can understand more, you can go farther, you can do more things with it, it opens vistas that were not there before. Uh, Nima Harkani Nahame talks about the mountaintops, you know, um, a, a new, a good development, a useful discovery is one that shows you where the next mountain is. It shows you the pathway to jump from one to the next. Um, so if you look at what Stephen Wolfram's doing from the point of view of being fertile, is it going to offer Vistas, and the answer is it's incredible. If Stephen Wolfram's ideas are correct and he plays out, it would be taking this giant arm and just sweeping the whole table of physics of all the junk from the last 50 to 70 years and starting over fresh. And which is how I actually got to the idea that computation has to be fundamental because it's so rich in its implications, it has to be true. And some of the first things you get is like Stephen Wolfram will point out, is space and time separate again. They're no longer space time. We, uh, general relativity breaks apart. Um, the, the world becomes, you, the, the difference between quantum and classical world all of a sudden takes a different uh, form. Uh, computation can only happen in a world of where strict locality applies. So computation is the world of classic physics. Uh, quantum world is the world where strict locality doesn't apply to the laws of physics. 
um, for computation to happen, there has to be distinct steps, tunk, tunk, tunk. So that first time into blocks. So time breaks up, it's no longer a continuum, it breaks up into uh, pieces. When you do that, space time goes away, um, the universe becomes finite. Um, again, Steve, um, John Archibald Wheeler in his talk, uh, his idea of it from bit talks about this. And I, I think I connected to that. Um, do you want to see the document? I could pull it up. Uh, not really. I just, people can look it up. But okay. at the beginning of, okay, Stephen Hawking is, is famous for his work with black holes and black hole entropy. And it, whereas a lot of our notions of entropy and holographic principles and kind of go to, to Stephen Hawking, but before Stephen Hawking was Bekenstein. And some people think that Bekenstein was actually the heavy lifter theoretically, and Stephen Hawking ended up getting all the credit downstream. Bekenstein, if, um, hopefully I'm remembering this correct, was John Archibald Wheeler's grad student. And so Bekenstein got a lot of his ideas from Wheeler, and Wheeler's ideas are framed up in this classic paper that most people read, but then immediately forget, called It from Bit. And in it, at the very beginning, he has four foundational assumptions. He calls them four no's. I think I, if I pull them up here someplace, I think I wrote them down. This is what happens when I take notes that I can't find anything. Tell me about it. I don't <laughs> even want to show anybody what my desk looks like in front of me here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I have the I have the document queued up so I can show it easily enough. Are they readily findable in the document? Yeah, they're pretty much right at the front. Okay, let's. Let's look at it then. For okay, yes, yeah, the second page. Yeah. Okay, but in the abstract, there are four conclusions of things that cannot be. Right. So are if you go to the next page, is where it should be. Right oh, now. I see the three questions, the four no's, and the five clues. No tower of turtles. No laws, no continuum, no space, no time. So we're over here. Now, now you look at, you go on YouTube and all of the popular physics, the TED Talks, they're all talking about information and black hole entropy and, and all of that comes back to this seminal thinking. You know, the paper is, is just part of a more broader thinking. Notice no tower of turtles. That's almost a religious statement right off the top. I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners know the reference. But in this, what John is say, what Wheeler is saying is something completely different than something that Richard Feynman would say. Because I, I believe Richard Feynman pointed out that he asked him about the nature, he was asked about the nature of physics and he compared it to an onion. You keep peeling off layers. We understand this layer, but as we understand, then we, it reveals a new layer. And he would say that physics just keeps going down. Wheeler's was saying is no, there is a core that at which you stop, you, you find it and that's it. So there's no infinite layers in the Feynman sense. There is no, but we don't take that. That's almost, well, I would say that's a religious statement in some sense. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, but if you look at all the physics that has come since this, Bekenstein and everything, the whole industry that has grown up around information and entropy and all that, no one talks about this. And the other one that really fascinates me is the no continuum. What was he looking at when he said that? That's completely gone. No one has ever gone back and looked at this paper and considered the original statements. No continuum means the universe is finite and discrete, which is what Stephen Wolfram is trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. In a yeah, universe he's very specific about that. That is finite and discrete, 
you don't have calculus anymore. You lose new, you, and with calculus, you lose things like Louisville's theorem and Nerzer's theorem. You all, you'll hear everyone talk about how the laws of physics are reversible. And that gives a fundamental problem. And well, if the universe is finite and discrete, you automatically lose pure reversibility. The arrow of time gets the direction right out of the box. The second law of thermodynamics comes out of the fact that the universe is discrete. So that's what I'm saying. The route that Stephen Wolfram is taking is faithful to John Archibald Wheeler's original vision. And if you do that, it just sweeps everything clean. And it's the most fertile idea out there. And that's why I think it's so, I find it exciting. Now, if you lose calculus, you lose the math of continuous and differentiable functions. There goes string theory out the door. Because <laughs> string theory is, is is, I don't know, I, I, I won't <laughs> use the word I'm thinking of, but it's mathematical fill in the blank. Well, you get I, away with that, it. doesn't Chaitin talk about the, the need for a new kind of calculus? I mean. Um... Yeah, Chaitin gets it, because, but he's a math, he works in logic and computation and set theory and game theory. So his brain is already working in that digital world, you might say. Whereas um, the people who do string theory, they're manifolds and geometries and 10 dimensions and... Well, so, so wait a minute, if you, if you, um, if you lose quantum, are you, you talking about... Quantum. Are, you, you don't lose quantum. No, you, no, you don't. Okay, because if you lose quantum, then you lose don't you lose all the stuff that, I mean, all the stuff that technology is founded on today, right? It comes no, we, out of the quantum theory. No, we don't lose quantum. We, we just, what we lose is the necessity to, to, to find a merge between them. We oh, set, between quantum and, and gravity, you lose that necessity. Yeah, that's the, that's the big conundrum everyone talks about is the fact that special or general relativity is, is, the, is the physics of the classic world. You know, the quantum mechanics is the world of the fine zone. And they don't mesh, they just will not fit. And so one of the reasons for string theory is to find some kind of uber theory of everything that mathematically you could combine these two into one bigger theory. And instead of solving problems, it's made everything worse. You know, there's 10 to the 500th power of possible solutions if you go into string theory. And uh, I think Feynman was saying, string theorists don't make conclusions, they make excuses. <laughs> but then we get into the multi-universe stuff, all the multiverse stuff and, and parallel universe. That's all there because of string theory. If we didn't have the string theory problem and it's a huge explosion of, of possible solutions, we wouldn't need the multi-universe. That goes off the tables. Well, there's no need for the multi-universe because in, in uh, Wolfram's universe, <clears throat> there are multiple potentials happening at the same time. Well, not at the same time, within the same universe. Because yeah. it's, it's because it's the rule ad is all possible rules. Right. <clears throat> so I haven't dove into his, his his stuff yet, so I have to apologize or, or back out because I, I've seen it, I know what's there, and I know mathematically I'm not, I don't have the, the brain or the, the time to spend with it to do it justice. So, but I'm, I'm trying to digest as much as I can from the outside. Um, well, how long have you been thinking about this idea of the universe being computational? Uh, five or 10 years, I think. Um, I was fascinated with um, Landauer's theorem or Landauer's principle, the racer principle that says computation always involves uh, a cost and entropy because information has to be erased 
a memory has to be erased somewhere. And when you erase a memory, um, the disorder of the universe is increased. So, and I was, and I've always been fascinated with Maxwell's demon. I think that was the beginning. And part of the problem, why I've been fascinated with Maxwell's demon is because it's the archetypal or prototypical life form. And if you could explain Maxwell's demon, then you could explain possibly the origins of life in general. So that takes us back to our first talk, all those, I don't know how many months ago or a year ago, looking for the origins of life and fascinated with Maxwell's demon and how Maxwell's demon could function. It's, it's, it's basically a state machine. It takes input, it makes decisions. And by the choices it makes, it was able to harvest energy and it can use that energy then to sustain its own physical structure. So Maxwell's demon is the ultimate life form. And uh, there was a funny little paper I, I read a long time ago. I, I think I left a link to it. It's called, what does Maxwell's demon want out of life? And then I got into that. And that posed the question, it took a look at Landauer's principle. Not all information is useful to a, a living organism. Maxwell's demon doesn't use, so not all information is physical. That raised that question. And, and I've gone off, it's taken me down this journey and I found out I'm, I'm at the same place. Stephen Wolfram is, is it, if you want to understand complex things, you don't look for complex things. You look for the simplest thing you can find. And Maxwell's demon was the simplest thing I could find that is a life form that satisfies all the quantities, qualities that we might assign to a life form. And that's what Stephen says. You start with a handful of simple rules and you can get infinite complexity. And one of the things I want to touch later on in the conversation, you don't get infinite complexity, you get infinite layers of infinite complexity. The world isn't just reducible and irreducible. You get a reducible world and then you get an irreducible layer above it, but then you can get there and everything's reducible here, but then there's gonna be another, like the girdles, you can keep adding axioms and keep going up the chain. So there's no tower of turtles. So there is a base, there's a starting place, but there's no upper bound to this, this layers of complexity. And that's one of the things that comes out of Stephen Wolfram's thinking. And again, if you're oh, in the process- oh, I, wanna, of, I wanna ask you something about this because in my, the way I'm picturing it, this um, hypergraph computational structure <clears throat> that he's describing is a thing. It, it has, um, it actually has a boundary on the outside of it, but there's no boundary inside of it because at, at least this is the way my mind reads it because of the way I think about how all of these different binaries in art, like let's take um, light and dark from light to dark is depending on how you slice it, it can be an infinite string. Mm -hmm. So, so anywhere that, if you were just taking light and dark and making your nodes out of the intersection of light and dark, a choice between this much light and this much dark and, and cooking them together in a node, um, every node, there would be an infinite number of possible nodes, an infinite, po infinite number of possible ways in which you could have something somewhere along the scale from light to dark, but it would st it could still be within this bounded universe, mm -hmm. because that's that's the way a painting is. A painting is a bounded universe that is been has been instantiated with ideas and information and the connections that are made between the different levels that can be. Um, instantiated of each one of these elements and principles. So there's an infinite number of possibilities, but it's still within this bounded structure. I, I, I didn't explain it very well, but, 
but that's the picture I get when I hear him talking. Uh -huh. I see something similar, that, but I, I, I look at it in terms of the creative process. We're mm -hmm. talking about it. When you're, when you're being creative, it, it could be music, it could be art, it could be physics theory. You make choices. Your intuition is telling you something. You, you're, you're being pulled forward. Mm -hmm. You make a guess. Well, that worked. Maybe that didn't. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That feels right. Okay, I'm going to keep going that way. Um, and this gets back to Thomas Kuhn, you know, that there's a certain emotional element in the creative process. Um, physics, math, same as art, music, they're all creative processes. So at some point, they should share the same, some, some commonality. And what I've been seeing in my own views is if you take Stephen Wolfram's computation is fundamental, you get the hierarchy of irreducible, irreducible computations, you get strong emergence. You get it, it's right there. You can't argue, it falls right out. One of the hallmarks of strong emergence is what's called top-down causality, that you get a group behavior, something computationally happens and there gets to be a group behavior happen. There's a new layer now it's, it's created and that layer can influence the layer below. Uh, so the ant colony is a good example of a cluster. It's a group, it's, the ant colony is irreducible relative to the ants. But when the ants come together, something new happens, it emerges. The survival of the ant colony as a whole then in turn shapes the evolution of the individual ants. So that's an example of top-down causality. But in your art, you're feeling something. There's something above you in the hierarchy of complexity. Ideas call it the realm of forms. Stephen Wolfram's Rouliad or Rouliad. Something is out there. You're sensing it. I suspect if I always imagine, you know, you explore, you're in the Rocky Mountains. How do you navigate? By about a partly pattern, you look for patterns that are familiar, things that fit, and then you look for anomaly. You look for the things that don't belong, shouldn't be there, out of place. And then you focus your attention and that draws you forward in that direction. Physics, math, the same way. You Robots, I'm, I'm working at the hardware level and I've often, said to people that when I'm doing hardware design, it's like the hardware tells me what it wants to be. And I think some people might think you're, I'm crazy, but I know you know what I'm talking about. Well, sure, that's exactly Sometimes. the way a painting is. The painting tells you where to go. If, if, you, if, you pay, if you're really willing to pay attention to it. See, this is the thing, I, I had a conversation the other day where I was um, pointing out some of the ideas of Esther Meek, where she talks about covenantal epistemology. That, that when you really care, like if you care about a rose bush because you wanna take good care of that rose bush, you get to know that rose bush and the rose bush will tell you what it needs, but you mm -hmm. have to care. So the caring is, is kind of first, the caring comes first on, on our side. So right. if you really care about finding something with your robot, then as you're looking at it and thinking about it and focusing on it, the robot is going to begin to tell you, in, in a sense, the robot tells you what it needs because, because there is this, um, McGilchrist's idea is a very big idea about the two different kinds of attention that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have. The left hemisphere has a very focused attention that's, um, for grasping and catching and that kind of thing. But it can only work on what has been given to it by the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere's attentional focus is very broad and open. And the right hemisphere bring, brings in what it notices and then the left hemisphere's attention can latch onto the part that is the, the real focal point for the left hemisphere. But um, this, this right hemisphere openness, what is it operating on? And 
Esther Meek talks about this idea that all knowledge that is available to us is a gift. It's an offering. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's in a, you could call it God's wisdom or this offering of insight to us that's being offered all the time, but we don't always receive it, right? Mm -hmm. But when the receiver is operating and we we accept it and bring it in, then that's receiving this gift. Mm -hmm. So that it's a relationship then. So you have to have this relationship with the giver of all good gifts, in a sense. There are probably a lot of people operating in this realm that don't even know him. They don't even know that that's what he's doing, but he's always making this offering. So there's always this new offering of wisdom and insight coming towards us. And when we are open to it and we receive it, then, then our left hemisphere can begin to work on it. And, and like what you're doing with your robot, Right. But but it only comes because you care. If you don't care, you're not going to accept it when it comes to you. So, yeah, but I think everyone who is creative in spirit has some similar way of, of talking about it. But getting back to Thomas Kuhn, you know, that the face, the, the there's emotion, there's there's something kicks you up to get going. And and one of my top three professors in my college career was a philosophy professor. And one thing he said back then, and I still remember to this day, he talked about the difference between passion and emotion. And he said, emotion is simply that which motivates. It could be anger, it could be hunger, but it could be a beautiful math theorem. It could be a piece of music. Um, um, Zen and the art of motorcycle makes mm -hmm. the quality, the notion of quality. There's something a motorcycle engine can be a motive, it can draw you, it can make you want to understand and get to something. Mm -hmm. Emotion can take out an anger, but emotion can also take the form of disciplined, focused effort as well. Passion, he said, would be passive, it's a letting go, being swept away. But I've always thought about. We tend to think emotion as, as illogical, but it doesn't have to be. But if the creative process is going to work, it has to have an emotional component because at some point you've got to get up off your butt and do something. The creative process is a sequence of choices by which you bring something that was formerly an idea or and make it physically substantiate instantiate it physically so to me that the creative process is a kind of a magic you have a thought you have and it doesn't have to be necessarily um physical i'm thinking like a dance um can capture an emotion a, a, a novel can capture an emotion so uh, your painting a, a, a good painting captures emotion, um, a story, which in a physical form. Am I making sense? Oh, yeah, I'm, com I'm, I'm completely with you. So um, I, the reason I looked like I was a little bit lost in thought is that when you were making that description, you, you're saying for the creative process to work, it's a sequence of choices by which you take something. I lost your word there, what it, what, what it was you said, and then it becomes physical you take something it's an idea an no idea physical form. okay okay and and physical. when you when you started saying that it mapped right over on it well it didn't map over it it showed me that the alternative idea that Chaitan put forth that i didn't like very much when he was describing what life is because he was using a description of life from some other guy who said that life is that which evolves to become something um, better than it is or something like that. And it seemed like that was very circular reasoning to me to use that definition as being the, the basis of life. But um, when you describe this creative process, that sounds to me much a much better description of what life is. Mm -hmm. Well, it plays out. So if you think of I'm thinking in terms of layers of complexity, and each layer corresponds to a certain form of computation. So when we speak of emotions, we, we don't tend to think of that as a computation. 
But if you look at how your endocrine system works, how all the, the chemical signals that go back and forth as you feel and you do, you can model that the endocrine system re response as a state machine. So we don't think of our emotions and, and hunger and thirst and anger and all that as adrenaline as, as computation, but, but you can look at it that way. And I think that's the amazing thing that comes out of trying to put on the glasses of computation and start looking things differently and seeing if you could see that computational process there and you go, oh yeah, there it is. Well, wouldn't that you know, be so I, wouldn't that be analogous to the Markov blanket idea of, of cognition? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. that comes okay. in. Yeah, he's. I, I think he he got a narrow. He's got he's he's the blind man who's discovered part of the elephant. Yeah. And so when I listen to him, it's like yeah, 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 you got it, but it's more. I know. I <laughs> keep wanting to jump in there and say, but 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 but. So next it's, week it's I'm next week more. I'm going to yeah. talk with uh, next week I'm going to talk with Cy Gart, who is a biochemist, uh -huh. who has written this wonderful book called um, The Works of His Hands, talking about how. I think it was around the age of 50, after growing up in an atheist household and being an atheist scientist all his life, based on what he discovered in, in uh, biochemistry, he became a Christian because mm -hmm. he couldn't deny it anymore, what he was seeing. Yeah. And, uh, and so I get the privilege of talking to him next week. I'm really excited about that. And, and I, I ran by him your idea of computation of the lock and the key idea as being part of the computational idea and he said oh yeah we can talk about that he said that lock and key thing shows up everywhere in biochemistry well Cesar Hidalgo talks about a plant as being a computational system mm -hmm. and so it's a very crude computational system but it, yet you can model it that way um, the one last thing if, if I wanted to get to I, I think is important is I, I there's a link to Chomsky's hierarchy of languages. Mm -hmm. and I, this I find absolutely amazing. And, uh, Is it a video? No, oh. it's just, uh, it's a link to uh, Wikipedia. I'm sure it Wikipedia. by itself probably is not much meaningful, but I'll try to explain it to you, the, our audience to help understand. No, maybe I maybe I didn't bring I'm that sure one. Sure, I, I sent it, didn't I? Oh, I'm sure you did. Um, just give me a second because I have your video up here. So um, let's see. Chomsky's hierarchy. You want okay. the Wikipedia or you want? Yeah, the just the Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay. It's just a it's a diagram. Is this it? Or do I have to go down further? No, that's that's right. Well, there should be a picture. You, we're covered up the, the diagram. Yeah, there you go. Right? No, too far. Keep, go back up. Is okay, it this stop. hierarchy yeah, right there, box? Right there. Yeah. There's a, a diagram. There's there's a high. Oh, this little one over here. Yeah. Right over Norm here. Norm Chomsky, before he he sort of you know the years have not treated him well. Um, <laughs> But in his younger days, he did quite some um, remarkable work in the area of computation and um, grammar. And you can back up to the so that we can see the, the definitions. But when people think of computation, they think of computers. But there's a whole hierarchy of computational structures. And for each layer in this hierarchy, each one is reducible within itself, but the next layer up is irreducible to the, from the one below. And each layer in the hierarchy has its own language or grammar in this case. So if you look at the type three, which is a finite state automata, that's your vending machine, that's your key and lock, that's your plant level of intelligence. And for every computational structure, which is the automaton, there is a language and a grammar that that computational structure will, what they say, accept or understand, recognize, maybe is another way to put it. These 
these languages or grammars then correspond to different layers of intelligence. So we are up in the type O or type zero a Turing machine. That would be your standard off the shelf PC. But there's a lot of computational structures. But the thing that fascinates me is what this hierarchy is telling you is between a language, which is just symbols, abstract symbols and rules there is a physical structure that encapsulates it and it will instantiate it. And so if you look at Stephen Wolfram, he's talking about the, the, the possible world of all possible programs, but that world of all possible programs has the potential to be physically instantiated in our physical world. And to me, I've, just, I've decided that that's how I describe the creative process is when you create a physical structure, which now instantiates what used to be an idea in the realm of forms. And this is the crossover. This is, this is the recipe that shows you how to do it and how it's done. So I probably just lost everybody. No, but I, but I, I do wanna ask a couple questions about this if I can. <clears throat> well, I hadn't... The point I'm trying to get to is when we talk about reducible and irreducible, it's not just one time deal. It's a bunch of layers. It just keeps going. Mm -hmm. Life is full of this example. And this is just the simplest breakdown. There's lots of nuance. There's a lot, a lot of. Um... Well, OK, let's um, let's just define terms here for a little bit. And then I want to ask you some questions about this chart. When you talk about reducible, is that um, when we talk about reducibility, is that in the same camp as provability and computability and decidability? Yes. So, yes. so they're interchangeable? Uh, I, yeah, pretty okay. much, I would say. Okay. So, um, not everything is decidable within a certain axiomatic framework. If you want to decide it, then you have to go up to the next level of complexity up. Well, which let's, brings let's, new grammars. let's take a look at this right here. Patient theory and so on. Do you have the impression he understood that stuff? Gettle's secretary that I hadn't, uh, maybe I, I didn't recall speaking to her. They're talking about Gettle. And she told me, Professor Gettle is very careful about his health. And since it had snowed, he was not coming into his office that day. And therefore your appointment was canceled. Hmm, and bad. I didn't have the heart to try to reschedule because it, two days later, I was, you know, there was only maybe two days left that week. And I was already heading back to so Buenos thing, Aires. Do you have the impression? California and Mexico City. Yes. Do you have the impression that Gödel knew about Shannon and information theory and so on? Do you have the impression he understood that stuff? Well, I had a very limited interaction with Gettle, but um, he did say very interesting. Fair enough. He, okay. he, he did read the paper and say very interesting. And it's a paper that I wrote for an IEEE information theory audience. Fair so enough. it's it's talking about the channel model of coding and decoding. The, the, that diagram is probably in the paper. I don't know. It's written in terms of Shannon information theory. So, um, so this, this point that you made about provability versus computability and this notion of an absolute notion and so on. I'm curious how Gödel thought about that, because in a sense, Gödel's theorem, you know, the, the question is, is Gödel's theorem a story eventually about absolute undecidability or is it merely a story about what is provable from the axioms of arithmetic and so on. And that's a very good question. Uh, Post asked that very well. Gödel himself did not view his incompleteness the theorem as an obstacle to human mathematical progress. He definitely didn't. He, um, he believed that human mathematicians can, under favorable circumstances, have direct access to the platonic world of ideas and intuit perceive mathematical truths, new mathematical truths. So Gödel did not believe, you know, 
he has papers saying this. Some of them may actually have been published posthumously because some of his papers, he would write them, he would correct them, they would even be, he would even correct the proofs. And in the end, he wouldn't give permission for them to be published. So there are sometimes several versions of very good papers in one of the volumes of his collected works are unpublished papers like this. Uh, but, there, but there are also philosophical papers that he did publish. Like he has a wonderful paper called What is Cantor's Continuum Problem, where he presents, as Martin, Martin Davis pointed me, that paper out to me, he said, you should look at this because Gödel's attitude there is quasi empirical. You know, he's, he's willing to add new axioms because they're fertile for pragmatic reasons. And he suggests that we need new axioms for set theory uh, to be able to settle the continuum hypothesis. Right. And that problem is still open as far as I know, because even though they've added projective determinacy, right, uh, to set theory now, uh, you know, in, in recent years, I'm not a set theorist and I'm not in touch with Bob Robert Solovey anymore. But my understanding is that um, the projective determinacy does not settle the continuum hypothesis, even though it does settle a lot of it does enable you to prove a lot of things that set theories wanted to prove. Well, I mean, so anyway, Gödel's paper has a very pragmatic attitude. You think that maybe Einstein influenced him in their walks, um, you know, that you should accept a new principle if it's fertile, if it enables you to prove things you wanted to prove but couldn't, or if it enables you to prove things that you could already prove but much better, shorter proofs. But that's, um, a, I mean, that's a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting view of mathematics because obviously that's very different from physics. Because physics, you imagine there is a physics and you have to find its rules or something. Whereas in mathematics, what you're describing is, you know, to make a more beautiful mathematics, you can add different kinds of paintbrushes, so to speak. Ah, okay, but I'm a Platonist and so was Gödel. So we believe there is the, the mathematical reality out there. Right. So that makes it a lot more like physics if you, if you take that stance. Right. You know, Greg, I, I have changed my point of view about this in the last two months. I used to not believe this, and I now actually am beginning, I, I'm agreeing with you, because I think what, what we're seeing is that, well, this is a, a longer story, but the, the sort of, the, the limit of how one understands physics, one can see why the universe exists, but the argument for why the universe exists implies that mathematics must also exist. And it implies that there is this thing that is sort of, that is mathematics, just as there's a thing that is the universe. And just as we as an observer in the universe sample some piece of that thing to see the physical reality we see, so similarly sort of as mathematicians, we have to be sampling slices of this kind of, in a sense, platonic thing that is mathematics. But I'm yes, yes. How you see this. Well, this is wonderful. Okay, so um, I know I went a little long there and we came back around to where we started, but I think that maybe this is enough to give people a taste of why we think this video is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Gregory Chait and Stephen Wolfram conversation. So I'm gonna put that and all the other links that we've used in the information section, along with some of the other links you gave me that we didn't use today, so that we can continue on with this conversation. Cause I, <laughs> I, think, I think you're really onto something, Glenn. <laughs> The ideas out there, I, I'm, I'm getting excited because when I go on YouTube and stuff, there's other people that are, are talking along the same way. And um, Well, that's encouraging to... because it would be easy to think that because Wolfram is describing something that is so radically new that he could get buried by the people who make a living off of keeping things the way they are. Well. One last, you know, hat tip to, to Thomas Kuhn and the whole idea of discovery. You know, if if Matt, if we're, we're discoverers, we're explorers, we want to acquire a tool set that uh, an explorer would, would acquire. And this this idea of a lot of the math, a lot of physics is we get the consensus, the textbook view, which is the polished, the cleaned up, the, the sanitized view. But that's not how it started. If we want to go exploring, we want to know what the explorers did when they first went out. We don't want to know what the encyclopedia says they, they did after the fact. So 
it's important if you want to go exploring in physics and math or any area, go back to the original, original sources. Go back, if you want to understand entropy and black hole stuff, go back to John Wheeler, hit from bit, and you realize that he was looking at something different. His original ideas are, have been dropped and forgotten. Um, talk about infinitesimals, calculus, a, a friend years ago did a paper, I don't know, I don't think it ever got published. He's talking about how Newton, Leibniz and those, they looked at infinitesimals differently than we do now. Their view of calculus on the way up is different from us looking back. Um, so yeah, uh, go back to the beginning. Um, look at, I found this with entropy. If you go back to the beginning, they had, they knew about entropy. They had, you know, 20, 10, 20 years before Boltzmann and kinetic theory of gases and the notion of disorder, the concept of entropy was already there. And so I was asking, asking myself, well, what were they looking at? It wasn't disorder because they didn't know about it yet. That didn't come to later. So always go back, look at original papers, find out what people were doing when the ideas first started to trickle out. So. Mm -hmm. Well, are you game for continuing this in the future? Yeah, I, I, we'll see what the, your, your commenters say. Um, yes, I, I hope people make comments. You know, the weirdest thing has been happening with my comments. I will get notifications that someone has made a comment. And when they notify me, they only give me like the first five words of the comment. And then uh, you have to click to get the comment. You have to go to the video. Yeah. The comments never show up on the video. So I've had some, that problem. I tried to comment on, on one of the year, earlier ones. And you, I, yeah. And I'm not just because I left links in or something. Yes, I think so. I think so. That's a good word for everybody. Don't. Don't put live links into your comments because um, I guess YouTube doesn't like that. And so then I never get the comment. And so I don't get to see what people said. And it's really frustrating because it, it'll sound like, oh, this is going to be a great comment. And then I never get to see what it is. Or if you want to put a link, do something to scramble it so the algorithm doesn't recognize it. Yeah. And the other thing is if people have a comment to make and you can't get it to show up on the video, my email address is kl w o n g 43 at gmail and i'm happy to to uh, at gmail.com i'm happy to get your um emails and i will try to post the the uh comment myself and see if that works because one of the real fun things about this whole conversation is being able to get the comments of everybody so we can interact and learn from each other so I really treasure your comments. Don't quit trying just because it's not working. Oh, I thought of something funny. If you want to know what the reducible world of art looks like, there's a lot of AI created art out there now. Uh huh. And that's kind of fun to see what if a machine just based, you know, did art based on whatever rules it had, that's what you would get. That's the reducible world of art. But good art captures something that a machine never could. And uh, so, yep. As I, I can't remember who it was that asked the question, he said, "You can get a computer that can win a game of chess, but could you get a computer that could create a game of chess? Could, could create create a game like chess? You know." Mm -hmm. So that that's the question. Well, this has been very stimulating. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm exhausted too. I feel like I rambled all over the place. But no, you didn't. It was. There. It was, it was very exciting. And I noticed recently that on one of my videos, they're offering transcripts. So um, it may be, transcript may be available. So I'm gonna take a look and see if it is because there were a lot of things you said that were real gems. I don't wanna lose them. Okay. Okay, thank you, Glenn. All right, thank you. Have take a great care. day, bye-bye. Bye.